Hello and welcome to Access Asia. I'm Yuga Hoye and here's what's coming up in this show. Anger at the world's largest iPhone factory as a fresh surge in infections tests China's zero COVID policy. Deprived of their right to education under the Taliban, we'll see how young women in Afghanistan are left with no option but to get married. And 45 years since the disappearance of Megumi Yokota, a symbol of Japanese citizens kidnapped by North Korea, we speak with her brothers still fighting to get her back. It could be another sign of growing discontent across China. Violent protests shook a mega iPhone assembly plant in Zhengzhou, run by a Taiwanese tech firm Foxconn. Frustration had been mounting at strict COVID restrictions at the factory. The unrest comes as the communist government has started locking down thousands of neighbourhoods to contain a fresh surge in COVID cases. Michael Maitland-Jones has more. It's a grim milestone for a country which has championed its ability to push back against COVID-19. Its record-breaking case numbers from the virus happen even while strict quarantine rules produce scenes like this as people queue to be tested. The number of new infections continues to increase. In the past week, an average of 22,200 cases were reported every day, which was twice the number of the previous week. China is the last major economy to still stick to a method of trying to get rid of COVID altogether. Streets across the country are empty as many in major cities are confined to their homes. Many schools and businesses are shut. We must adhere to the principle of people first and life first. The general strategy of curbing imported cases and domestic resurgences and the general policy of zero COVID. The policy may have saved lives initially, but vaccine uptake is still low in many communities and the impact of lockdown measures on the economy and people's lives is growing by the day. The United Nations launched a fresh campaign on the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. More than a dozen protested in Kabul over women's rights, closely watched by the Taliban. Since coming back to power, they have closed off the majority of schools to girls, leaving many with the only option of getting married. Emerald Maxwell reports. Mariam had hoped to become a doctor. Her father had always encouraged her studies. But everything changed when the Taliban came back to power. I had never thought there would come a day when we couldn't study anymore, when we wouldn't be able to achieve our dreams. Instead of studying, I now wash dishes, wash clothes and mop the floor. All this is so hard. With his salary almost halved under Taliban rule, Mariam's father felt he couldn't turn away would-be suitors for his daughters. Every time when they used to come by, I said that I wouldn't give the hand of my daughters. My intention was that they must finish university. After March, when girls weren't allowed to go to school, I saw that the Taliban weren't going to take a step back. After that, when the proposal came, I told Mariam that my previous experience of the Taliban tells me that they will not reverse their decision. A mixture of economic crisis and deep-rooted patriarchal values means girls all over Afghanistan share Mariam's fate. There was brief hope when the Taliban took back control last year that they would allow more freedoms for women compared to their brutal austere rule of the 1990s. But a planned reopening of girls' secondary schools in March was axed and restrictions on women have multiplied. Afghanistan's aid-dependent economy has also collapsed since the takeover, leaving half its 38 million people facing hunger. Sisters Sara and Fatima were left unable to graduate from high school and sit university entrance exams. After their father, the family's breadwinner, died from COVID-19, they decided that the search for husbands should begin. We're forced to marry because it's better to get married than be a burden for our family. We'd planned to continue our studies, but now there is no hope for us to continue our education. Experts say education is not only pivotal in delaying girls marrying, but also childbearing that comes with a higher rate of infant mortality and maternal deaths at a young age. One day in November 1977, a 13-year-old girl vanished from the Japanese coastal city of Niigata on her way home from school. Her name? Megumi Yokota, 
A quarter of a century later, North Korea admitted that its agent had snatched her away, along with 12 other Japanese citizens, to train spies. In a groundbreaking diplomatic move, Pyongyang in 2002 returned to five of them, but not Megumi, claiming she had committed suicide. She has since become a symbol of Japan's effort to bring back all of its kidnapping victims, as North Korea has become increasingly isolated. I spoke with her brothers, Takuya and Tetsuya Yokota, who have spent the last 45 years waiting for answers, and I started by asking how they felt when they first learned of their sister's fate. For 20 years after our sister was kidnapped in 1977, we just watched the time pass by with no clue as to what had happened to her. For years, our case was only regarded as a suspected kidnapping, largely ignored by society. And then, at a summit meeting in June 2002, Pyongyang admitted for the first time that it was responsible for her kidnapping. We were stunned to find out, after years without a trace, that our sister was in North Korea. At the same time, we started to hope that we could be reunited with her soon, but things weren't so easy. She had been missing without a trace for so long. So what we felt at first was huge relief, to learn that she was alive, at least up to a certain point. I don't know how to describe it, but when I saw a photo of her released by the North Koreans, I immediately knew it was my big sister. Of course, we have not been able to confirm it was her, but as a sibling, I had no doubt that it was my blood sister. When North Korea returned five Japanese kidnapped victims 20 years ago, they said your sister was dead and only sent her ashes later, which didn't match her DNA. Why do you think they lied? I believe that our sister and another victim, Yaiko Taguchi, got to know some closely guarded secrets about the North Korean leadership and the Kim family. So they're afraid that if they let them return, they'll let the cat out of the bag, which would be inconvenient for the North Korean royal family. We've also heard that they were forced to teach Japanese to North Korean secret agents. So another possibility is that Pyongyang is afraid they would reveal the names and identities of its agents hiding and operating around the world. That's why they are continuing to carry out this hostage diplomacy. And do Japanese people still live in fear of being kidnapped by North Korea? Quick snatchings by North Korean agents are unlikely to happen today. But Japan has very large coastline areas, and we can't deny that they are underprotected, especially at night. We have had incidents where the Japanese Coast Guard exchanged gunfire with a North Korean ship with secret agents on board. There could be drug traffickers coming from that country, too. So the dangers are out there. We do face the threat of North Korea coming towards us. In 2014, an arrangement was made for your parents to meet Megumi's daughter and granddaughter. Are you pushing for them to come and live in Japan? Absolutely not, and this is a highly risky issue. It will be great if she could come to Japan and live a happy life, but if it means she'll be forced to separate from her family and be placed under constant surveillance, not being able to speak freely, then it will only mean that she's used as North Korea's mouthpiece to spread false claims about Megumi's death. We have no desire to spearhead such a move. Diplomatic channels are all but closed at the moment, with North Korea becoming increasingly hostile towards the West. But you do still keep faith that your sister will come home, don't you? That country has a history of using threats and provocation to get something out of us when the times are tough. So I'm not pessimistic. I do think that the chances of getting her back are higher than a few years ago. We often say, in our effort to save the kidnapping victims, that when the rescuers go to look for climbers who've gone missing in snowy mountains, they go to save them. They go because they believe they are alive and don't go to look for dead bodies. We're the same. We continue our rescue effort because we believe Megumi is alive, and I hope the Japanese public understands that. That was Megumi Yokota's brothers speaking to France 24. As the Qatar World Cup continues, 
Japan have come under a spotlight for what they do off the pitch. FIFA posted this photo of how the team left their locker room all tidied up and complete with a thank you letter and origami crane bears, a sign of peace. And their supporters' behaviour also caught the attention of many after a video of them cleaning up the stand after a match in which Japan didn't even play went viral. Twitter users in Japan, though, have mixed reactions so far. While some said that they were proud of their fellow citizens, others pointed to their relative lack of interest in human rights issues. And that's it for this edition of Access Asia. Do stay tuned for more world news here on France 24. In Charlottesville in 2017, a far-right rally descended into carnage. A white supremacist drove his car into the crowd of counter-protesters. There's still very much a heavy aura that hangs over this place. It was a scene that I'll never forget, and it was I'm not the same person that I was. Um... Five years later, have the residents recovered? Are the far right and white supremacism still a threat in the country? Watch Charlottesville Revisited on France 24 and France24.com.